So the episode title draft is uh, TKTKTK, which I'm, I'm sure has a, a great acronym behind it, right, Scott? Something like that. This is a the like reporter's secret I learn upon working here at Lawfare is that TKTK is, I guess, what reporters and newspaper people use to fill in empty language they haven't written yet because you uh, there's no word in English language that has those back to back, I guess. Uh, it has become very useful. I start using it everywhere now these days. Uh, most of my articles are just TKTK when I hand them in waiting, <laughs> waiting for editor comments, and I pretend they're done when they're really not. Yeah, I, f- I find it super useful. Like, uh, you know, when I'm writing and I get stuck on something and I just, you know, I need to note it down, but then move on. I just write TKTK. So it's very helpful. I also learned about this from Lawfare, but until now, I didn't know why. I didn't know that it was because TKTK, like there's no English word that has it. I, so I could be completely I making that up. with the flow, peer pressured into TKTK. I'm just worried what other secrets I don't know about that are supposedly journalistic norms that Lawfare is just developing out of thin air. So there's a lot of mis there's a lot of misspelled words in journalism apparently. Lead, L E D E, and graph. I I I guess it's I guess it's so that you don't if like if people are writing it down, then you can do a search for it and then pull it out because it's not a real word. But I don't know. We also have to bear in mind these are journalistic norms inherited through the lens of Benjamin Wittes, uh, which is a very particular lens. Like you may also believe that newsrooms require dog shirts be worn on a daily basis. And that is, in fact, not the general policy, even at The Washington Post and Legal Times. Well, the other thing that we have imported from, by the way, this is the the most lawyerly conversation of like, there's some journalisty thing convention. <laughs> like, come on, people, we use incomprehensible Latin in our normal life. It's completely comprehensible if you know Latin, Natalie. If you have spent a lot of money to go to three years of school <laughs> and have been in- instructed to it's make sure totally that you justify it somehow by <laughs> speaking a language no one else understands and is generally superfluous. Um, anyway, the other uh, journalistic convention that we have imported, which is front of mind for me, is we have a student contributors program that we refer to as our Cubs program, which every year when I send an email email to our new set of cubs, um, who are all law students who take themselves very seriously, and for excellent reason, they are all excellent students. I have to explain to them that cubs is not derogatory. It is a journalism thing imported from our beloved editor in chief who has a journalism background. And it refers to cub reporters, which are junior reporters. But they don't usually make them wear those cute little ears like we do. (laughs) I think that's the difference. (laughs) Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Rational Security. I am one of your regular co-hosts, Scott R. Anderson. Thrilled to be back in the virtual studio with one of my other regular co-hosts, Alan Rosenstein. Hello. And we are bereft of Quintos in this particular episode, but we have brought in an absolute slew of our law of her colleagues to try and make up for her absence. We're thrilled to be joined, uh, as is often the case, by law of her executive editor, Natalie Orpit. Hello. Next up, we have Eugenia Lostri, our fellow in technology policy and law here at Lawfare, joining us once again. Welcome back, Eugenia. Thank you for having me. And we're thrilled to be joined for the first time by none other than our new Tarbell Fellow in Artificial Intelligence and Assistant Professor at St. Thomas Law School, Kevin Frazier. Kevin, thank you for joining us here on Rational Security. Awesome to be here. Thanks for having me. We like to think of rational security as the uninformed corner of lawfare here, because uh, this is where we really try and tackle topics we don't necessarily know anything about. So we're willing to let you uh, step out of the ivory tower down in the muck with the rest of us as we try and hash through some of the national security news from this this past week. You know, Alan's already in the muck, so I'm ready. You know, I just followed wow. his lead. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Bold. Bold. Someone tweeted at us, actually, at RATSEC a few days ago. Uh, saying that you know some last some 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 previous uh, se- uh, segment we did on trade policy was bad because there's a bunch of lawyers talking about stuff they didn't know about, and I wanted to respond, and be like, dude, that's the whole point, that's the charm. I mean, such as such as there is charm to what we do here. That's like we, the fun of it. We need a tagline for rational security to remind people that this is the show where we don't a, necessarily a know what we're talking about. Exactly, we're trying to figure out just like everybody else. Um, well, maybe we'll work that into the podcast intro uh, in, uh, in in the coming weeks. But for now. We are excited to have you 
all here this week for what we are calling the Cute Little Ears edition in honor of the obligatory Cubs uniform for anybody who might be considering to applying to our student contributor program this year. Not seriously, but we might implement it. Let us dig into the week's big national security news stories because there are a number of them we need to dig into up many of your respective alleys. Topic one, waiting to expel, expel, exhale, somewhere in the between the two. <laughs> The New York Times reported this week that the anticipated transfer of almost a dozen detainees from Guantanamo Bay to Oman was halted in the wake of the October 7th massacre. This as Oman is reportedly preparing to expel a number of former detainees already resident there with their families. What do these developments mean for the effort to resettle detainees and ultimately close Guantanamo? Topic two, the first law of robotics is don't talk about the law of robotics. AI safety is back on the front pages again after the resignation of much of OpenAI's super alignment team, which had been tasked with preventing the AIs being developed from becoming a threat to humanity. The U.S. Senate, meanwhile, has laid out what it sees as a possible solution to how to regulate AI, but is it on the right track and just how much should we be sucking up to our future robot overlords? And topic three, 20,000 leaks under the sea. Strategic competition is slowly leading U.S. officials to give more careful consideration to the network of undersea cables on which much of the global telecommunications system relies and which China and Russia seem increasingly intent on being able to access or disrupt. But what will addressing this threat require and is the antiquated legal regime governing undersea cables up to the task? For our first topic, Alan, let me hand it over to you to get us started. So before we jump into the specific issue of Oman and these detainees and their transfer or lack thereof. I, I want to actually start by just getting up to speed on the state of Guantanamo and the state of the detainees generally and the state of the transfers. And I, I will just say, you know, we're coming on 25 years of this. Um, it's kind of crazy. I mean, not quite. 22 years. years. Let's say 22 years. But I mean, It'll be 25. I mean, I am very confident. I'm curious what you think, Natalie, as our expert, and I'll come to you next. I'm very confident that we will we, we will get to the 25-year mark and still be talking about this. And when I was in law school, I, I wrote, you know, when I was on the, the law review, I wrote a piece on the, you know, 2011 NDAA and, and the uh, transfer restrictions at the time. And, and the issue was already 10 years old at the time. And everyone was already bored of it. And it is just amazing. I mean, sad, obviously, that we're still dealing with this, you know, 10, 10 years after that. So, Natalie, I mean, I think you're kind of our, our Guantanamo expert. Um, you've thought about this issue for a long time. You know, you've done pro bono work for uh, Guantanamo detainees. You've thought a lot about this. You care a lot about this. Before we get into the specific Oman issue, can you just give us a sense? Where are we with these detainees? What is their status? Why can't we just transfer these people? Because as far as I can tell, the executive branch just does not want to keep these people in Guantanamo Bay for the rest of their lives. And yet it seems almost impossible you know, it's it's a real Hotel California situation. Yeah, so it's a big question. I'm going to do some big picture scene setting because I think there it is a very complicated context and also actually very important to understand to really recognize the extent of the problem and why it is that it's just so hard. So starting with the fact that there have been a total of about 780 detainees who have been held at Guantanamo at one time or another. We are down to 30 detainees who are still there. So, you know, do the math. There have been 750 people who have been transferred out of Guantanamo at one time or another. This started during the Bush administration. There are three different categories of people who remain and who had been in detention before that, but I'll focus on the 30 who are currently in detention. The three different categories are the individuals who are charged in the military commissions. Um, there are 11 of those. There are 16 detainees who are cleared for transfer. I'll come back to that. And the rest are being held in indefinite detention. The distinction between the second and third categories is based on what's called a periodic review board determination. This is a one might say in quotation marks, due process mechanism, whereby the government has to, after some Supreme Court decisions in earlier in the 2000s, has to actually justify, at least in some sense, uh, continued law of war detention, given that the uh, original conflict under which the detentions happened is arguably passed. This is a larger legal question I won't get into the weeds on. But basically, the 
it had been so much time and there was so little um, explanation as to why all of these people were there that the periodic review process is now required. It's an interagency process where every, essentially every um, agency within the U.S. government, intelligence community, defense, et cetera, looks over the um, individual's background and current status and does a, a large assessment of whether it still makes sense for them to be detained. So the 16 people who are cleared for transfer, that what that means is the periodic review board has decided that they are no longer a threat to the United States and they should be uh, released for, from Guantanamo. Um, I will just note that at least two of the 16 have been cleared since about 2009, 2010. This is not at all unusual. There are many other people who have been transferred out more recently who were held for just an unbelievably long period of time after they were determined to not be a threat to the United States. Part of the reason that it is so difficult to transfer people out, even after a very lengthy process of determining that they are no longer a threat and that the government has no authority to keep them anymore, is that they cannot be transferred to the United States. And the reason for that is that in um, 2012, um, Congress passed a law that is part of the NDAA and has been renewed every year since then um, that prohibits the use of funds for transferring any detainee to the United States for any reason. So even after people are, you know, technically no longer detainees um, because they are <laughs> should not be in detention. They're not eligible to be brought to the United States under any circumstances. So what that means by extension is that to get people out of Guantanamo, they need to, they meaning the US government has to work with third countries and negotiate terms of settlement, of resettling them. And that takes on a lot of different forms. But you can imagine there's sort of the diplomatic level of the third countries have to have some reason to want to essentially do this huge favor for, for the United States of taking someone that the United States has detained um, initially on alleged terrorism charges, or I'm sorry, lack of charges, terrorism suspicions. And then there's the element of actually providing for people. There are many, many, many detainees who suffer from not only physical injuries remaining, but also from very serious uh, trauma related, um, having to do with their treatment and torture in US custody. So they need to have treatment and support relating to that. So I'll just the one other thing I'm, I meant to note just because people lose the thread of this that is quite outrageous um, is of the 780 people who um, have been held in Guantanamo. I mentioned the 11 still there who are charged in the military commissions. There are exactly nine other people who have been transferred out after having been charged and convicted in the military commission system. So literally everyone else was not convicted in any sort of criminal or law of war proceeding. Okay. So that, that's a super helpful background. Let's now turn to the specific issue here. And Scott, maybe you can give us some some kind of foreign policy context. Why Oman? Why not Oman now? And what is with the Omanis expelling the Yemenis that were previously transferred? And what does this have to do with Gaza? I looked at a map and I will say there is a extremely large, the entire Arabian Peninsula quite literally stands between, the Arabian Peninsula is not a small peninsula, between Gaza and Oman. It is not entirely obvious to me what the connection is. Uh, that latter one I'll circle back to in a minute, although I am also a little puzzled. But let's talk about Oman for a second, because Oman's an absolutely fascinating country. It's one I've actually had the opportunity to visit a number of times. Uh, I've spent a fair amount of time there. Uh, and it's just a really interesting culturally and politically and historically in the Gulf generally. Um, it has pursued a sort of quietest politics through much of the 20th century, a, a bit of a departure from a lot of the other Gulf states, where it has very consciously sought to maintain connections with Iran, with other players in the region, sought to stay out of a variety of regional conflicts, even as a number of the other Gulf states, other members of the Gulf Cooperation Council, along with Oman, have often leaned into conflict with uh, particularly Iran over the last 20 or 30 years, um, and particularly strongly in recent years, primarily under the kind of strong pressure from 
uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, kind of in a similar way that Qatar serves as the kind of intermediary between the United States and a lot of Western governments and branches of political Sunni Islam, uh, like the Taliban, for example, most notably, um, or, uh, you know, branch of the Muslim Brotherhood are present in Qatar and oper- operate there in ways they couldn't in other countries in the region. Um, and are, it serves as a little bit of a, a neutral meeting ground for engagement with those groups. Oman plays that role quite frequently with uh, in regards to Iran, and certainly other, certain other regional actors as well, but particularly in regards to Iran and Iran-associated uh, kind of factions. And so that's become its sort of political salience and significance in the past several years, is that it has this intermediary role. At the same time, it's also been very politically stable for most of its history. It doesn't have a long history of succession disputes or internal strife. Um, it borders Yemen has had a very long history of civil disturbance and civil strife, uh, which makes it perhaps all the more impressive. Um, it is an absolutist government, uh, like it is very much an absolute monarchy. Um, they have kind of consultative councils that are kind of elected, um, but primarily really is uh, even by the standards of the region, an absolute government. But it's one that's been relatively stable and relatively politically moderate. Um, some people attribute to the fact that uh, uh, a, a plurality, if not a majority of uh, Omanis are from uh, the kind of Ibadi uh, school of Islam, um, which is some people frame as kind of a more moderate view, although I don't think that's a complete or necessarily adequate explanation. But nonetheless, it's been seen as a place in the region that is culturally familiar, linguistically familiar to people from the Arab world, particularly from Yemen, who might have been uh, detained at Guantanamo, need to be resettled, but is a place where they have uh, a political culture that is less likely to create opportunities for those people to be re-radicalized, and that the Omani government has then now consciously developed a curriculum that at least people have said uh, has been effective at kind of trying to uh, re-educate and de-radicalize essentially people sent from Guantanamo. Also, um, in fact, people can't be sent back to Yemen, both um, under international law, there's a non-refoulement, which is that people can't be sent back to countries uh, where they are at risk, but more relevant for the United States, since we care about domestic law more than international, is um, the same uh, law that I was talking about before has an enumerated set of countries to which people cannot be transferred, and Yemen is on the list. And that's exactly what I was going to get to. So for Yemenis in particular, because you're next door to Yemen, you're quite close, you're proximate. Uh, it was a very convenient place to station a number of people who were detained from Yemen and put them both to be put through these kind of de-radicalization programs that were installed, uh, and then to kind of take up longer term residence. If you had to move families for people who had families, things like that, much more realistic possibility for Oman than maybe other parts of the region. But as has become clear in the reporting over this decision the Omani government has reportedly reached but not executed yet, at least as we've seen, the agreement to accept these people didn't come with a uh, agreement to engage in any sort of long-term resettlement um, or residency. And that appears to be what the Omanis are ending. You know, it is should be a policy problem for the United States, I think, because even though the United States domestic law and international law only really directs direct transfer from the United States to Yemen – There is a policy rationale why the United States doesn't like the idea of resettling people to Yemen that's very prescient and very still very real, which is that Yemen is unstable. Yemen has ongoing violence. Yemen has lots of armed groups. And if there's a concern about people being re-radicalized or somehow trying to rejoin the fight, all concerns that you hear in the context of these sorts of debates, and that probably motivated some of the congressional concerns that led people to hold up the transfer after the October 7th ma- massacre, then that those sorts of uh, actions become much more plausible in Yemen. And maybe the calculus is that these people are less likely to do that because they've been resettled so long. Maybe the realization is like that risk is always kind of overstated in the first place, which I think is, is often the case. But nonetheless, like these people moving from Oman to Yemen should raise, I think, some policy problems for the United States. But that doesn't mean that it outweighs all the other concerns at issue here, including the fact that Oman may just feel like we didn't make an indefinite commitment to house these people. And if you're going to send 11 more our way, we need to make space, as uh, one U.S. official described it in some of the reporting. Well, and it sounds like Oman started reaching out to the 28 men who had been resettled there before to let them know that they were going to lose their residency status before discussion. I mean, it's it's unclear what the timeline is, because it's unclear how long the discussions were underway for the 11 new detainees. But, you know, the fact remains, as you said, that 
there is a diplomatic discussion and commitments made at the time of transfer. But the initial 28 men have been there since between 2015 and 2017. It's not like Oman took them under false pretenses and then kicked them out a couple months later. They've been there for a long time. Um, reportedly, they've, you know, Oman gave them a lot of resources and support and the rehabilitation program that you mentioned. You know, I'm not defending this. I, I think it's a very unfortunate decision. I don't think it's actually completely unreasonable because at the end of the day, the problem is that a third country is going to do what is in its interest in negotiations with the United States. And it's it's the US's problem that we captured these people, which, you know, Scott, you're you're right about the rhetoric about not wanting people to to go back to Yemen and that being a, a policy concern. But I will just say in the way that that you framed it because of the way that the rhetoric is, you know, the it's unclear that the 28 people or these new 11 people are going to be quote unquote re-radicalized because some of them may, be, may have been completely innocent. We don't know that they were ever radicalized. That's part of the issue here is people were swept into Guantanamo with un- really, really, um, in some cases, no basis whatsoever. So uh, in the spirit of getting way out over my skis, I have no expertise in this field. So let's see what comes about. My read of the New York Times article and the canceled transfers was that this was not really a policy question so much as just sheer politics. I mean, it was Democratic officials reaching out to the Biden administration at the last second saying, this is bad optics for us. We can't move forward with this at this time. Am I am I reading too much into that just sheer political answer? Or is that just a function of reporting? Or is it that balance of politics and policy? So I don't know if it's politics or, or optics in particular, because I'm not sure how people are perceiving that this would be read or, or spun. But I will just say it's it's not as abrupt as it may seem from the reporting, because the reporting sort of glossed over the fact that before the United States can transfer anyone out of Guantanamo, they are required to give Congress notice within 30 days. So the objections were raised, this was sort of buried in the reporting, in a closed door meeting, um, which was specifically about the notification that's required under, under the NDAA. So I, you know, we don't know exactly how it played out behind those doors or what the subsequent uh, discussions were within the administration to decide to actually call it off. I mean, the one thing that was abrupt that in case people didn't read this reporting on their own that we haven't mentioned yet is these 11 men had had all of their belongings collected. They had been told they were leaving. The plane was literally on the tarmac. And they were being prepared to go. I will tell you from having been there that preparing any detainees to move anywhere on the base is like a multi-day, very complicated endeavor. And so, I, I mean, it's it's just w- worth taking a moment uh, to exercise some humanity here, especially for the people who have been cleared for over a decade to to be in in that scenario. It's really quite tragic. And the the other thing that caught my attention was that. You know, the Biden administration had initially kind of signaled, and I'm, I'm curious to hear more about the signal that it was going to try to bring down the number of detainees. And we saw steps like inviting the UN to come in and look at the facilities. So to Alan's question earlier, are we moving towards some sort of, of eventual transfer out of the remaining detainees? Or does this seem like we're just going to be here 2025 2035, 2045, is there an end date? And do we think that this is actually going to maybe galvanize more public attention again to this issue? Well, I'd be interested in what others think about that last question. So the strategy has been, you know, as as reported, and this was the strategy in the Obama administration, too, was to just decrease the population of people at Guantanamo as much as possible at a certain point. And this this had a much more credence years ago when there was a period of time where even detractors were really concerned about the cost of Guantanamo because it's millions and millions and millions of dollars per year per detainee to keep the facility going. 
so the the it's sort of been an attrition model trying to try to transfer as many people out as possible. There are the 11 people who are in commissions. Um, so those proceedings are underway, but we are pre, 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 pre trial. I mean, none of these cases are going to trial anytime soon. So there won't be convictions. So there won't be any adjudication. There are the people who are being cleared through the PRB process, which that's, that's the place where really there is room to decrease the population. The real problem that exists is the population of people that the U.S. deems not safe to transfer and uh, wants to continue to detain, but has not and probably will not, um, by all accounts, be able to charge in the commission system, which means that they are just indefinite law of war detainees. They've been called the forever detainees. They're the ones that really present the the problem for closure. And as it stands, because of uh, the ND- the law in the NDAA that uh, forbids transfer to the United States, those people can't be moved off of Guantanamo for detention inside the United States. It's also not clear that there would be legal authority to detain them inside the United States, but that's a different story. But I, I also think it's worth not glossing over the fact that like politics really does play a very big role here. And I think Absolutely. does appear to have played a role in this decision. Like these are politically charged. And the fact that it happened after in the vicinity of October 7th, uh, in its aftermath, uh, at least some of these concerns, I, I think does, is it shouldn't be surprising because the concern about these transfers leading to some people being re-radicalized, which has happened in some people who have been exited Guantanamo. There are a handful of cases where it has happened in Israel. We shouldn't minimize that too much. But I also think it's easy to overstate the risk of that or overstate, frankly, the marginal impact that has on U.S. national security, even where it, it does occur. But I think in the aftermath of October 7th, the viewpoint of those legislators was, this is going to look too bad. You know, we are seeing a major U.S. ally experience an unprecedented terrorist attack. Even though, as Alan noted, geographically, there's not a lot of tie between these people where they'd be going, the attacks. Politically, there's not clearly a lot of ties. I don't think many of them are going to be able to run and join Hamas in the Gaza Strip. I don't think any of them are going to. It is this optics issue. And it's something that has plagued Guantanamo policy for well over a decade at this point, which is that everyone agrees it's a problem. Everyone agrees the status quo isn't there, but no one's willing to assume the political cost or take the optics hit to actually work towards a solution because there is no good solution. And that's why we have been stuck with the status quo. I, I suspect these 11 people will eventually be transferred out, probably to Oman. Like, I suspect this will eventually happen. You'll have to wait for the right moment, but I think it will get there if they've already been cleared. But as Natalie notes, you know, the other 19 people, particularly the minority that has never been charged by the military commissions, and those who have been charged are probably never going to get a satisfactory or complete resolution. At least it doesn't clearly uh, it's like they look like it's going to happen anytime soon. There's no good solution for them. Um, and eventually, the United States is either going to have to pay to detain them indefinitely, which is legally questionable, ethically questionable, and highly costly, if nothing else, or accept the fact that these people have to go somewhere and find some way to resettle them or somewhere else to move them, uh, or bring them to the United States for trial and then deal with the consequences of that, the option that the Obama administration tried to pursue 10 years ago and was was shut out of by Congress. Um, so uh, until you get the political... Factors realigning, I think there's a clear outcome uh, from this whole whole status quo. There's one other factor that we haven't mentioned, which is that there has been reporting um, somewhat recently, I don't remember how many weeks ago exactly, but that the 9-11 defendants, of which there are five in the military commissions, um, were in uh, plea agreement negotiations, which would be a way to at least move the commission's process more quickly, um, which could get to an adjudication and may uh, change the picture for how and where to detain those people post-conviction. Well, Natalie, I know you have some other obligations today, so we are going to excuse you for the remainder of our conversation. Um, But let us now move on from one tricky set of legal issues that Congress refuses to wrestle with to another set of tricky legal issues that Congress is kind of trying to wrestle with, maybe. Uh, And that is the question of AI safety. An issue that we are seeing very much on the front page very often these days, but never perhaps more than this past week, when we saw the quote unquote super alignment team, or at least the leading members of it at OpenAI, uh, arguably the leading AI company uh, in the private sector, uh, resign. Um, a few somewhat more uh, openly and contentiously and with reservations than others, uh, some more f- in a more friendly manner with OpenAI and with uh, its uh, leader, Sam Altman. Um, but nonetheless, the disbandment of this team, whose 
explicit task uh, who, whose mandate had been to help account for the risk uh, that AI would become a humanity-threatening technology as OpenAI proceeds to develop it. Instead, several senior peoples, including a co-founder of the company, resigned and left. Um, and that team has now been folded into OpenAI's kind of broader architecture and development. And they've established instead of a board of advisors that is, in fact, chaired by several board members and Sam Altman himself. Um Eugenia, let me turn to you first on this. Can you tell us a little bit about these developments at OpenAI and what they mean to you? We had one piece come up on Lawfare this week arguing that it was a really bad sign for how seriously OpenAI actually takes safety. And you and Alan uh, and a few other co-authors I know wrote a piece back in the uh, end of last year when we first saw the Sam Altman uh, being ousted and then returning to open AI kind of fiasco uh, as a sign that self-regulation really is not the only way we can, or is not a plausible way forward. Does this help reinforce that conclusion? Does it give some slimmers of hope? Where should this fit into this broader evaluation about how we need to go about regulating this revolutionary technology? So I I think the developments this week really underscore what Alan uh, Chini Sharma and and myself wrote about a few months ago. I think this just shows that you cannot really trust that uh, safety is going to be taken seriously <laughs> um, or be held as a priority against other other business priorities. Right. So, so I think that to me is further confirmed. You know, I don't think it's the only news story about AI this week that kind of leads me in that direction. When you look at the kind of funny AI overview hallucinations from Google, for example, which again, yeah, no one's going to eat rocks as part of their diet because Google said so, but it, it's still concerning the kind of results that you get, right? That that this is in arguably like the biggest product. Google search is massive, right? And and you go for it and it's supposed to give you a trusted result. And it doesn't. It tells you to put glue on your pizza so that cheese sticks to the crust. Um and again, it sounds funny. Look, I think that would work. <laughs> and, and I was gonna say, you know, speak for yourself. A rock a day keeps at least one doctor away because you're dead. But okay. you know, so just So it seems like glue on pizza is less controversial than pineapple on pizza, right? But I think to me it raises questions about the commitment to safety. You know, I would wonder about how and why they decided to launch this product in such a kind of massive way instead of focusing on some areas where it could be trusted. I guess the question that came to my mind is, you know, does Google AI overview mean that AI is the new arbiter of truth, right? Because if you are not going to be clicking into any of the other links and you're just going to you know, go to what shows up at the top of your screen. Is is that the new truth, right? Is that what we're just supposed to believe? So I, I guess I'm skeptical, right, of, of the commitments to safety. Um, and I think disbanding the the team at OpenAI is, is, is a clear sign of that, especially when you read um, some of the comments that members of the board had about Sam Altman and the way that he had communicated to the board, the way that he was managing relationships internally, um, kind of playing members of the board against each other so that he could get rid of some people. Yeah, I, I just I just want to flag that. I, I think that this is like a, I mean, I, I don't want to say like this is the more important story than the super alignment thing, though I tend to think it actually is. The stuff that's coming out about Sam Altman, and like we should be clear, right? Like Helen Toner is hardly like a disinterested observer in this. But you combine that, you combine with the stuff that happened at Y Combinator, you combine where he was, you know, fired. You can you combine that with some of the concerns with his first startup when he was like 20. It raises a lot of concerns about Sam Altman and his running of, of OpenAI. I, I, I suspect that the next six months of journalism, of tech journalism, will not be kind to him. And I actually would not, I'm not sure he'll survive, actually. Um, we'll we'll see, but no one is irreplaceable. And um, at some point, 
uh, if it's true, right, and like like every you know, I, there may be good explanations for all of this stuff, right? And and I you know I still haven't made up my mind. That's a that's a big problem. Can I just add one small thing to add about Sam Altman? And it's that uh, he and it, this is the nichest crossover, but he met with Argentina's president Millet, um, and there's the very awkward picture of both of them going like thumbs up, and the idea of like an Argentinian libertarian AI is like the scariest thing to me. <laughs> well, and it just all points out the oxymoron of safe AI. Like if you are pushing the boundaries of AGI, if you are trying to develop human level intelligence, that's going to lead to incredible amounts of risks uh, on our labor displacement, on our politics, on you name it. We can see these horrible outcomes come about. So when push comes to shove, developing safe AGI, in my opinion, is a bit of an oxymoron. And here I would agree with Alan. I mean, we have such a, a interesting structure in place for open AI, right? If you were to draw up, oh, we're going to create the right checks and balances to ensure that everyone's held accountable. We're going to come up with this robust board that's going to serve as an oversight mechanism. At the end of the day, if you have people that are going to try to find every loophole in that structure and try to exploit that structure and undermine the folks who are supposed to be uh, providing that oversight, well, then this is the outcome you, you have come about. And uh, not to plug another podcast, because obviously this is the best podcast known to man. You're new but, here, Kevin. Tread lightly. Kevin, yeah, yeah. you're fired. Get, yeah, get yeah, out. Yeah, get yeah. out. A, I'm sorry. It it's was been a, a great. Time. It's been a great week. Yeah. It's been a great week of your fellowship, <laughs> yeah, yeah, buddy. Yeah, great, great fellowship. You're off the island. Yeah. Uh, see y'all see y'all later. Uh, the, the TED show with Helen Toner, giving that a listen, I, I very much recommend just to hear her tell – her side of the story, obviously it's just her side, but to hear her description of what Sam has done behind the scenes to the board should give everyone a tremendous pause uh, and a lot of concern that arguably the most powerful company right now or one of them is being led by someone who is trying to evade the safety mechanisms he claims to want to impose on himself uh, and yet is continually finding ways around them. So, Kevin, let me turn to you now for the second part of the story, the recent developments, the other aspect of the recent developments we want to pull into this conversation. Um, because the, the, the solution that Eugenia and Alan uh, and Chinny came to in their piece a few months ago was essentially, look, self-regulation isn't the answer. You need actual regulation, old school, top-down government regulation. And we're seeing maybe the first steps towards that coming out of Congress, particularly the Senate, uh, in the last week or two. And you wrote a piece about it for Lawfare, laying out some ways that it might be progress, a sign of progress, and other ways it may be lacking substantially. Tell us about how you came out on what we're hearing from the Senate and where you come out on it. What promise does it offer and what promise does it still have in terms of a way forward? Yeah. So when you say that football is a game of inches, I guess AI regulation is a game of centimeters because this did just about nothing. Don't don't bring sports ball. Into, no, this no, is a no sacred. This is a ball, uh, rational security is a safe space for me. And despite hey, Scott's attempts to bring sports ball into it, don't don't you too. Hey, Scott. We can chat as much as you want about sports. I'm here for you. All Let right. That's what I like to hear. But, but I will say, go go Timberwolves. <laughs> go I'm Timberwolves. Go and Wolves. I know that's basketball. There you go. Oh, wow. Identifying ball sports. This is good. This is progress. <laughs> so, you know, I All think All of this for... is giverish to me. I just want to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like football, which is to say soccer, but with your hands. And it's it's a whole complicated thing. I refuse to learn it. I... I <laughs> can't it's one of the things that i refuse to learn that and knowing how to convert celsius to fahrenheit no <laughs> hey but you know now google might be able to help you with that it i might don't be trust it. i don't yeah. trust it <laughs> eat a rock and then try to know what the temperature is you got this so I, i'd say though that this ai roadmap it was released by the quote bipartisan senate ai working group that implies that there were a lot of senators backing this roadmap. In fact, there were just four. And it is bipartisan, and it did include Chuck Schumer, which is substantial, right? Schumer's obviously not a nobody in the Senate. 
But this wasn't some broad representative legislative proposal that came out. Instead, it was four senators who had conducted nine more or less behind the scenes, quote, insight forums with a bunch of industry insiders, including Sam Altman, who talked about AI, its potential development and potential ways to regulate it. And so this AI roadmap that they proposed wasn't some sort of specific piece of legislation. It wasn't some sort of timeline for adopting legislation, but instead was a broad overview of eight policy topics with general framing about the way they thought that congressional committees could now go about thinking about regulation. So it was in few as few words as possible – a plan to plan, which after so much resource uh, resources and time went into this effort, was kind of received as quite disappointing. So, so far the responses, with the exception of a few folks, has generally been that this was wildly disappointing because of the absence of specific policy details about how the Senate was going to approach specifically regulating AI. And I think that's a pretty fair critique. Uh, given that we are coming up on an election, given that we are seeing more and more need for AI regulation, the fact that we didn't have a more concrete proposal come out of all of these efforts was a little surprising, especially given how much uh, Schumer and others had been touting this as an important step forward. So I, I have three takes on the roadmap. And so let me go through them before you know, you jump <laughs> at me. Um, but given especially yours, I, I I would like your thoughts on this. So my first thought is this question, it's about this question of lack of transparency, right? The fact that as we've seen, there's been some concerns about this whole forum not being sufficiently open, inclusive, transparent, which I think ties in an interesting way with the question of what is the role of big tech in shaping the discussion about AI? Right, both you know, for the executive, for Congress, but also in academia and even in think tank spaces. There was a Tech Transparency Project article about a roundtable put together by Representative Kana with academics to talk about AI. And the article highlights that many of them had some sort of tie to big tech, regardless of whether they were, you know, pro innovation or they were criticizing uh, big tech. I, I think it is interesting for us to take a step, you know, take a breather maybe and think about, are we asking these questions? Are we focusing on the things that we're focusing about? Because big tech is kind of uh, shaping the landscape and telling us what the interesting questions. And if you want to get funding, these are the things that you should be studying and paying attention to. Connected to that, I think, is this concern from civil society about the roadmap's lack of maybe concrete ideas about how to pay attention to the impact of AI on civil rights and civil liberties, right? I, in my mind, this connects to the concern that some advocates had last year or when this whole conversation about generative AI started, that the focus on this catastrophic risk of AI or the long-term risk of AI would suck the air out of the conversation about how is AI being deployed right now that is actually causing harms now. It's, it's already deployed. It already is creating issues. And we're focusing so much on that long-term view that maybe we don't have sufficiently concrete proposals uh, for the now. And I think that's similar to something that we discussed last year when the executive order on AI came out, where I think here on Rational Security, we were talking about the lack maybe of some of those more concrete proposals that would tackle the current harms. So I would be interested, Kevin, Kevin in hearing you know, your thoughts on that, if the roadmap was sufficiently directed to, to deal with some of those. And then finally, and maybe back to the question of safety and the commitment to safety, why are we not talking about liability? Now, Alan Cheney and I wrote about that in our piece. I'm going to keep plugging it. Um, but similar to in cybersecurity, you know, the, in cybersecurity, you let years go by of letting self-governance happen, of hoping that there would be sufficient incentives in the market. 
And only recently, they were like, oh, well, that didn't work. Maybe we should actually hold you accountable for the safety results of your products. So so where is that now? Why, where is the lesson learned from that applied to AI? And why are we not seeing more of that? So over the next three hours, I will address each of those comments. Now, uh, so I, I think the the first point about the lack of transparency and the industry setting the agenda, I do think is a very fair critique. The Insight Forums did involve a range of experts, not all of whom had ties to industry, for example. But when you give the Sam Altmans of the world a platform to kind of set their agenda, to be front and center before policymakers, it's hard not to think of them steering officials in a certain direction. Even now, Sam Altman is coming out with random statements about, oh, now's the time for a new international agency. And who knows, three months from now, he may say, ah, sorry, I meant we need to have a better domestic agency. And that gets huge headlines. And it distracts policymakers and the public from other more concrete proposals. So I do think one of the major issues is just not having a broad set of independent experts in the academy, in Congress, writ large, who we can depend on to help shape this regulatory agenda. So I think that's one area of concern that we need to continue to address. And I'm excited by efforts to try to get more academics, for example, writing about AI safety and addressing these topics so that we can inform policymakers from a more independent perspective. With respect to how do we balance these tensions between short-term AI risks and long-term AI risks, my answer is do both, right? We should be addressing both of these risks. I think the more important issue with the AI roadmap wasn't so much that we were inadequately distinguishing between short and long-term risks, but that Senator Schumer and others specifically said the North Star of this roadmap was innovation. And so long as the focus is on innovation and the U.S. being the leader in innovation, well, then that mentality just fosters that AI arms race with China, with Russia, with others. And that, to me, is the most dangerous concern. And so what we should be more focused on is getting more of this language about responsible AI development, right, where we are developing safeguards for potential risks more so than just trying to be the leader in innovation, whatever the heck that means and whatever the heck that entails. And finally, on your third point and liability, here I'm going to plug another lawfare piece, Gabe Wheel's piece on liability, I think is really important to to dive into. Gabe Wheel is a professor at Toro Law, and he's written extensively on the idea of liability. I'm going to punt to him and give everyone a little bit of homework as a law professor. That's my right, so I have to do that. Uh, and another scholar who's written quite a bit on this is Annette Lior, and she has has done a lot of great scholarship here. I think one of the big barriers is quantifying the risks. How do you quantify the risks posed by AI right now to impose some sort of liability regime? It's a really tricky question uh, and one that's going to need some more scholarly analysis and more uh, insight writ large. And once you've quantified those risks, if the risks are as severe and as significant as some people fear, well, then who the heck in their right mind is going to insure any of these AI labs, right? Would you ever want – who would develop that policy if you knew the potential for catastrophic risk – was, according to folks like Chair Lena Khan, around 15%, right? If you have a P-doom of 15%, what insurer raises their hand and says, yes, I'd like to insure the end of the world? So those are some tricky questions. I know that was a, a quick breeze through response, uh, but all of those are fantastic questions that we need to keep answering. And I'd say one of the most important points, just to sum it all up, is the need for independent expert concrete analysis to guide congressional uh, response rather than just another roadmap or, I don't know, some sort of Google Maps, because that's even going to be worse for developing policy. You know, I kind of want to ask a question about digging into the civil liability question as a background issue, but not under a new regulatory or liability framework, but under existing kind of tort law frameworks, right? Like other industries, when we see emerging technologies, what 
we have seen happen – this is painting a super broad brush. Uh, so it's broadly generalized. But I think it's fair uh, – a fair generalization to say what you've sometimes seen happen is you see a new technology get rolled out very aggressively, particularly from our kind of technology industry that has – that's part of the culture is like build the plane while you fly. It imposes costs on people. And then you know five years in, those costs – bounce back against the company, become very expensive because they're happening at scale. Lawyers catch up, plaintiff's lawyers catch up, you begin to see class action lawsuits. And all of a sudden, the industry actually has to account for that, both because they can't be insured, it actually affects their bottom line, the dollar amount gets in. And then at times, you see things like you know, Section 230 be kind of, being kind of one of the leading examples in terms of uh, uh, providing internet services, where you see the industry come and say, no, actually, this exposure to civil liability actually may hinder our ability to develop this technology. Uh, and this is a technology where everyone agrees, AI, we want to some degree to develop, and we want to be able to competitive with it in other countries that are actively developing, like China and Russia. So I guess the question I have is, are we seeing or beginning to see any of this talk about existing tort liability frameworks? popping up as a counterbalance to shift the costs of these negative externalities of AI, of the AI industry, AI development, the real costs that we're experiencing already back on the AI developers in a way that, if nothing else, may force them to take them into account. That might not, that probably will not address the black swan risk, the kind of tail risk of, you know, Terminator type scenarios, but it does seem more effective about handling or, or might be one avenue for handling things like discriminations being systematized in AI, mo- AI models, inaccurate information, you know, them proving as vectors for misinformation. All those things are harms that we're familiar with at, just at a different scale and through a different mechanism. Am I off base on that? What do you all think? My like one cent here, because I won't claim to be an expert on the, the tort question in particular, but one concern I think that is limiting tort as a as a mechanism is identifying specifically that harm resulting from AI, right? Tying it back to a specific AI model and a specific use case, that's a difficult thing to do that we have not quite yet mastered, right? In the same way that in a cybersecurity context, attribution is one of the hardest things to do. I think that's going to continue to be the case with AI and even more so with AI, because it's so embedded in everything we do. So depending on the context, it's going to be really hard to say, you know what, because of that AI model, that resulted in X percent more harm, right? How we go about determining that's going to be really difficult. One context in which I do think we'll see more responses and pushback on companies sooner rather than later will be labor displacement. So already uh, we've seen some voice actors, for example, who have had their uh, voices impersonated or used by AI labs starting to push back and say, hey, I didn't I didn't hear you uh, reach out for proper consent to use my voice in that regard. And I think we'll see more of that. Uh, maybe Scar, Scar, Joe Scar Joe, national yeah, hero. Scar Joe, you know, I, I need Scar Joe to get on this. I need Colin Jost to. If, if, you, put, if you weren't already in love with Scar Joe, this is just yeah. another reason. First loss in translation, now this. Two, two oh. big W's. Well done. Right. Just keeps winning. So we, we need a lead plaintiff. And could you ask for someone better? But uh, with that said, I do think this will become a bigger issue as we see more labor displacement in particular. If we can have a clean case study, right, of a profession being pushed out in a way, that could perhaps lead to, to some claim. But uh, I think we're going to need to see far more research done on attributing harm specifically to AI advances and AI integration into specific fields. But happy to hear from other folks. I just flag, I, I'll be interested in seeing how the EU's AI Act actually is implemented because they do have liability for AI systems, right? So whenever that actually comes into effect, um, I'll, I'll be interested in seeing how how that plays out. Um, but I think to your point, Scott, there is an interest, maybe just not in the US. Fair point. Well, we are running short on time. So we're going to have to leave this deep dive for a deep dive of another sort, uh, because we are going deep, deep, deep under the sea for our third topic. And that is the issue of undersea cables, a secret dark horse favorite of many of ours here at Lawfare uh, that, uh, Kevin, you have been kind enough to dig into us for Lawfare recently. And the crux of the issue, I think, is this, just to tee it up before I hand it over to you for some thoughts, is that we have come to rely over the course of the last century through a practice dating back 
to the 19th century of our telecommunication system, particularly transatlantic, transpacific, international telecommunication system, relying heavily upon networks of underseas cables that continue to be governed by a fairly antiquated law and policy framework um, that is now facing new challenges because of the threats real perhaps imagine, but in many cases seem somewhat real, of strategic competition, specifically concerns that China has through in a variety of venues used its role in global technology, telecommunications in particular, as a means of engaging in espionage uh, and potentially leveraging itself in a position to uh, be able to use that uh, control over those mechanisms in the event of a conflict in the future or between it and the United States. And Russia, perhaps, as always the case, being a little bit more of the brinksman, uh, actually being willing to engage in more efforts of sabotage uh, and tapping into these wire systems, even though it may not be quite the actor that China is in the same way, um, but nonetheless posing this kind of strategic threat um, to what has been for much of the last century and has rapidly become a essential framework for a lot of the services we have come to rely on in the United States and many, many others have around the world. So, Kevin, you've done some really smart reading and thinking about this for us here at Lawfare over the last few weeks. Tell us a little bit about how you're thinking about the issue and, and what makes this issue particularly compelling today, how the government is beginning to think about and reconcile with these dangers. Yeah, I appreciate the compliment of really smart. I should probably start off with one of my favorite quotes from School of Rock. And I know this is attributed to someone else, but those who can't do teach, those who can't teach, teach gym. Well, in the case of legal studies, those who can't study cybersecurity, study undersea cables. I am not technical enough to dive into cybersecurity. So instead, I dive into undersea cables, which I think are a woefully neglected topic. And here it's the perfect regulatory storm because you have 800,000 miles of undersea cables that are the size of garden hoses that can break just be upon a rock rolling across that cable, right? And they're all privately owned for the most part. And in addition to being privately owned, they're also privately repaired. So there are just 20 to 30 cable repair ships that are privately owned that we count on to repair these cables when they snap because of a storm, when a fisherman drops their anchor on that cable. And so this whole system is incredibly fragile, and yet we rely on it for 99% of all internet traffic. And for the folks who are thinking, well, gee, this is silly. Don't we have satellites to just solve this issue? Well, because of the fiber optic cables that are used in undersea cables, the speed with which internet travels below the sea is five times faster than sending it up into space. So the next time you ask, do I want five times slower internet? You're probably going to say no. And that's another reason to pay attention to undersea cables. And so the reason why this is becoming so much more significant is we're seeing increased reliance on high-speed internet traffic, and we are seeing greater capabilities by China and Russia, for example, to be able to exploit these cables. So the story that grabbed headlines that was covered by the Wall Street Journal was that one of these private cable uh, repair ships, which is owned by our majority ownership share is held by China Telecom, which the FCC had previously revoked its license for to operate in the United States, that cable repair ship just disappeared from maps for a couple of days. We weren't sure where that cable repair ship was going. We weren't sure which cables it may or may not have been pulling up. And so we're seeing that this whole system, which has just been tied together by a bunch of private shoelaces, is suddenly becoming very much susceptible to uh, interventions by bad actors. And so now's the time to increase awareness of how we can actually go about protecting this undersea cable system before we see it exploited in some, some really dangerous ways. Well, Kevin, so how do we do it? Well, Alan, let me give you a couple of possibilities. Uh, one would be developing what are called dark cables. So dark cables would be cables that are laid uh, in a way that is not known and laid in destinations that are not known to bad actors. So right now you can pretty much find any undersea cable you want. Um, they're publicly known. And so you could go if you really were feeling 
crazy, go snip one of those cables, go find one of those cable landing sites and see what kind of havoc you can harm. A dark cable, in contrast, would be harder to detect and only known to the government and the private uh, cable layer. So that's one strategy. The problem with that approach is obviously it's very expensive and you may actually increase the odds of the folks who don't know about that undersea cable, let's say dropping their anchor on that hidden cable. So right now about 40% of all cable breaks are caused by fishing accidents, dragged anchors, forgotten nets, all that sorts of stuff. So uh, those are the pros and cons of dark cables. One of the more likely scenarios that I think is ripe for more investigation was actually proposed by Prime Minister Sunak back when he was a backbencher, I believe the term is. If anyone's more familiar with UK politics, feel free to uh, to jump in there. But uh, he had proposed the um, use of more sensors. So way back in the Cold War, the US actually had quite a sophisticated sonar sensor system so that we could identify where submarines were going uh, around the world. Reviving that system to be able to detect when ships are sailing next to undersea cables is one really smart approach to begin to gather more information about which ships, which submarines were near which cables before and after a break. And that way you can better attribute who may have caused that break. Uh, So I think that's a really important solution. And one final one I'll throw out there is the idea of cable protection zones. So right now, a lot of cables are just kind of strewn about all across the coastline, for example, in the United States. If you instead mandate that cables go in specific zones, then you can better increase the odds of enforcement in terms of preventing certain ships from even nearing where those cables are laid. Um, But that would obviously require a lot of expense to get some pre-existing cables moved uh, to certain areas and comes with a lot of enforcement costs. So how we're going to create the whole fleet of ships necessary to police those areas is a major question. So Kevin, we had we talked about this for like an hour last week and Kieran plugging our, our own. It wasn't podcast. enough. <laughs> it wasn't enough, clearly. Um but Yeah, Kevin, take take note to see Eugenio's <laughs> plugging our own podcast, not someone else's. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Experi- ah, an yeah. experienced hand. <laughs> Took me over a year at Lawford to figure <laughs> it out. But, but something that we talked about a lot was the question of redundancy and how that can help. And, and this question is not my own original thought, but rather something that a listener asked me after our conversation. So I'm just relaying here. But is the limited kind of geographic availability of landing spots a concern? Because the cable needs to like come out somewhere. Right. So if we are suggesting, well, let's have more cables, right, as a way to create this redundancy, does it eventually become a problem where to actually surface them? Is, is that part of the, of the thinking around this? Yeah. I'd say the broader concern about cable landing sites is more how to protect those cable landing sites from potential espionage or from potential bad actors going in there and and breaking the cables more so than a limited space for where those cables actually land. So you need to make sure it's a safe spot and you need to make sure it actually connects into the terrestrial system in a, in a easy fashion. But the politics around cable landing sites can get pretty intense. So for example, Facebook tried to lay a new uh, cable on the Oregon coast a few years back. And the city, which was a small city, was just enraged because of the construction that was required, because of the fences that were going up. And so that's kind of the larger issue around cable landing sites. Um, You've probably walked near a cable landing site and not even known. So in terms of there being some sort of physical limitation, that's, that's not really an issue in this case. Kevin, I want to ask you, because I have my international law nerd hat on, a little bit about the regulatory system, about who owns these cables, essentially, if something happens to them, right? Because you have cables that substantial portions of them, the land landward side of either end of a cable, of a transatlantic cable, let's say, right, is on the exclusive economic zone or the continental shelf or the continental margin kind of, right, uh, of the country. So these are areas where it's accepted countries have 
kind of both resource exploitation rights and some degree of jurisdiction, kind of like less than it does in their territorial waters, but some degree of control. They could assert jurisdiction, I suspect, over disruptive activities here. But a substantial portion of these cables is under international waters, high seas, right? And so what is the jurisdictional basis for kind of objecting to, as an international law matter, disruption of those things? Like the, I know the law of the sea convention guarantees a right to lay cables. And I would assume that come, come with an implied, if not express right to maintain cables. Um, in the high seas, even where, so long as it doesn't interfere with like maritime traffic and other people's rights, essentially. But does that extend to a right to to defend them or regulate them? And how big a barrier is this kind of little bit of a, a lacuna in terms of who has regulatory over authority over these or jurisdictional authority in issue in some of these coordination efforts, particularly when we're talking about like deep sea, real deep sea cables that are in the high seas? Yeah, it's quite a big issue because UNCLOSE, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, doesn't have a lot of strong teeth with respect to punishing bad actors who go about intentionally breaking an undersea cable. To the extent it does address it, you have to pass enabling legislation to actually bring that provision of UNCLOSE into effect. And for those who don't know, the United States has not ratified UNCLOSE, so that's not even available to the United States. If we did ratify it, we would still have to pass that enabling legislation. So that's a two-step process there. And even then, the provision within UNCLOSE isn't as explicit with respect to these bad actors coming in and disrupting cables as we'd like them to be. So, for example, some legal scholars say that you could not punish someone for attempting to break a cable. Uh, there are also questions around whether or not UNCLOSE covers protections of undersea cables during times of war and uh, in other contexts such as espionage, whether that's even covered by UNCLOSE. So there's a huge gap here uh, in international law. And you're right to point out that this is just a jurisdictional headache. In addition to the questions raised by international waters, even thinking about coastal dynamics in the United States, where you have the first three miles of coastline generally under the provision of states, right? So that whole complicated question adds uh, more barriers. And then once you get to the federal question, there's yet another layer of complexity because different agencies have different responsibilities for protecting these undersea cables. So in some cases, the Army Corps of Engineers even have some responsibility over undersea cables. We have the EPA with some responsibility with respect to prevent or ensuring environmental issues don't arise from the laying of cables. So it's a whole nasty area that we need a more comprehensive approach to. Well, folks, that brings us to the end of our time together this week. But this would not be rational security if we did not leave you with some object lessons to ponder over in the week to come. Alan, let me start with you. What do you have for us? So my favorite five minutes in all of cinema, and it really is my favorite, I'm not exaggerating, is Alec Baldwin's scene in the, I think it's from the 90s, Glen Gary, Glen Ross, the remake of the, of the David Mamet play. Um, a, a part written specially for Alec Baldwin. Uh, I think it's not in the original play, it's just in the movie, um, of the abusive master real estate salesman who comes in and just, I don't even know how to describe it, just delivers the just the greatest pep talk slash beatdown speech um, in possibly human history. This is the famous always be closing uh, speech, though my favorite part of it is actually put that coffee down, <laughs> coffee is for closers. <laughs> Um, which is which is excellent. Uh, and uh, our very own Kevin Frazier mentioned a always be cobbling version of the speech. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And it turns out that um, a few years ago, or uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe like 10 years ago, SNL did a skit where they had Alec Baldwin, I think he was hosting, he must have been hosting that episode. And they do a skit where it's Santa's uh, workshop, and it's a bunch of elves. Amy Poehler is one of the elves. Uh, it's great. Uh, and they bring in Alec Baldwin to deliver a always be cobbling speech. And it is unbelievably funny. So thank you, Kevin, for this. I watched it like seven times in a row. You should watch it. Then you should watch the always be closing speech. And you should watch the always be cobbling speech. It, I mean, who says we can't have nice things anymore?
It is a must watch. And I just, for the record, need to have this down that I did get one thing right on the podcast. Yeah, no, that you nailed it. Even what, e- even if your fellowship at Lawfare is an otherwise a total failure, Kevin, this this one contribution totally makes up for it. Come to me Thank for you, those sir. SNL highlights. That oh, that'll be so my good. legacy. I'm fine with that. Excellent. Well, uh, on a slightly heavier note, I'll share my object lesson uh, next. Um, there is a phenomenal article that ran, I think, last week, uh, possibly the week before, I think it was last week, in New York Times Magazine, titled The Unpunished, How Extremists Took Over Israel. It's by Ronan Bergman, uh, who's a phenomenal, I think Israeli scholar, if I recall correctly, who wrote uh, Rise to Kill First, uh, Rise and Kill First, excuse me, which was a phenomenal history of Israel Israel's use of assassination, um, and along with Mark Mazzetti, uh, New York Times reporter. Um, and it's this really, really deep dive, beautifully and really insightfully written and researched account of the rise of, you know, I think what can fairly be described as kind of the radical right in Israel uh, and uh, the increasingly central role they've played and come to play in the current government there. Um, it is really important context to understand the Gaza conflict and events in West Bank. Um, and while a lot of people I think who've been tracking Israel will be familiar and Israeli politics will be familiar with a lot of the broad contours of what they're describing, I think it does a phenomenal job pulling together a lot of threads. And particularly at a time when New York Times has come under a lot of criticism for some of the reporting and other aspects of the Gaza conflict, I found this to be an exceptionally well done piece um, and inc- very insightful and useful one. Um, so I'm going to commend that to folks. Uh, as I know, lots of folks listening to the podcast have been following events in Gaza quite closely. And I think this is a, a very valuable contribution to the literature around uh, that and the context in which the Gaza war and the October 7th massacre have occurred. On that very, not very light note, uh, Eugenia, let me turn to you for our next object lesson. What do you have for us this week? That's so hard to follow, Scott, because (laughs) you went serious and I refuse to be serious about my object lessons. I usually do too, you know, but every once in a while I got to bring, Quint is not here to bring us down. I've got, I've inherited that duty. uh, So it falls on my shoulders, sadly. Okay. Okay. But I'm going to be telling on myself and what I do with my free time because (sighs) background, context. So I've been playing Baldur's Gate 3 for the second time. So I'm in my second round, and I've decided to do an evil run, because the game allows you to just choose whatever you want to do. And so I thought, okay, this is going to be fun. Um, But it's also traumatizing, and I struggle a lot with the choices that I'm making. So when I need a break from that, I go to my new game, um, which is my actual object lesson which is Life is Strange. Now, this game, it's lovely. It's about a teenager that finds that she has the power to rewind time, like the last five minutes. And she's actually using it to solve a classmate's disappearance. So it's a it's a mystery. I'm impressed because she's not just using it to fix awkward interactions, which is like what I would have done if I had discovered that I had that power when I was a teenager. But, you know, it's it's a very nice game. It has a lovely soundtrack. Um, and it still allows you, you know, if you, like me, enjoy making decisions that can change, alter the course of the story, you can still do that without actually, you know, choosing to murder everyone like Baldur's Gate <laughs> does. So if you want, you know, still control, but in a nicer way, I, I recommend Life is Strange. It's, it's quite nice. I feel like that is an HBO uh, long form drama series waiting to be made uh, of some sort. More kind of a I kind would of a that. Uh, uh, oh gosh, what was the detective thing with Kristen Bell? Why am I blanking on this detective show? Do you remember? I don't know what you're talking not, about. Oh. Not True Detective. No, no, no. Kristen Bell. <laughs> it was a long time ago. That's quite different. Cut it out. Cut all this. Oh wait, out. wait, isn't it? Isn't it Verona, Veronica, Veronica Mars? Veronica Mars. Exactly. Oh. It's like yeah. Veronica Mars in the MCU uh, kind of unit vibes. I'm getting off of this, which I feel like that's a sure. lot of of, of Genre is brought together. Um, I have a sad confession specifically for you, Eugenia, is that Baldur's Gate 3 is the only video game I've bought in more than a decade because uh, I'm not a big video game person, but I, I do I do love the old Baldur's Gate games. I played it for exactly 90 minutes since buying it. Uh, That's better than last ago. time we talked about it, which that was is, like 15 yeah. minutes. So good I, think I, I think I booted it up for an hour uh, before my daughter was born and uh, uh, my last little bits of free time. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever play it more, sadly, but oh, it's still no. sitting there on my computer in case well, I have Well, I can tell you how the difference different choices play out because again i'm on my second and apparently i haven't seen like 50 percent of the game Uh, amazing 
it it is at the top of my list. I, I will ask: Do you have like a do you have like a sweet gaming rig? I bought a Steam Deck before my uh, second kid was born, and I, I don't know. I, I can't I can't decide if I should spend sixty uh, bucks. Al- Alan, should, Alan, who has Absolutely. a presentation to give, and we're trying to wrap this up quickly for <laughs> for his sake. Yes. Has jumped back on to talk about his Steam Deck. To be clear um, to the listener, <laughs> when I had to when I had to upgrade my computer, I decided to go back to a PC instead of a, a laptop, and I bought a custom gaming pc i'm very proud of myself this is my adult money <laughs> nice. that is yes. that is totally fair uh well with that i'm glad somebody's enjoying Baldur's gate 3 out there one day perhaps in retirement i shall but until then <laughs> kevin you need to bring us home what do you have for your object lesson this week so I also did not go serious so don't worry uh, I, I'll, I'll go with the majority here so as much as I tried to not like this song, full disclosure, I may or may not listen to every Olivia Rodrigo song as soon as it comes out. Big fan, big supporter. And so when this new artist came out with what can only be described as a bop, uh, according to my wife, that's what I'm supposed to call it. I tried really hard not to like it. But Sabrina Carpenter's Mi Espresso song is going to get into your head. You're going to listen to it for at least five hours straight. And then you're going to do that again the next day. So as soon as you finish Always Be Cobbling, go watch Mi Espresso and you will not stop listening to it. So congratulations, Sabrina. I really didn't want to like you. And now I kind of like you. You wrote the song of the summer, which is definitely Mi Espresso. Can I just say this is the perfect song for a walking soundtrack, if you like walking around and feeling like you're in a movie, this is the song for you. It just gives you that little energy, that little pep. It's amazing. Love it. So you have time to play video games and walk around? You walk around both virtually and IRL? I'm furious and incredibly I, jealous. <laughs> I, I walk... IRL, but I also walk, I also have a walking pad, uh, oh. under my desk. So a lot of my working time, I'm just like reading and writing and walking. And I listening to me espresso. And listening to music. Yes. Perfect. Yes. yes. Excellent. Good. It explains the quality of my work. <laughs> right. Well, this, <laughs> super, this, super punctuated. Yes. <laughs> this explains so much. Uh, and I'm so glad to know. So this is a really, a really insightful episode of Rational Security. But sadly, we are now at the end, because we are out of time together this week. But bear in mind, Rational Security is, of course, a production of Lawfare, so be sure to visit us at lawfaremedia.org for our show page, for links to past episodes, for our written work, and for the written work of other Lawfare contributors, as well as for information on Lawfare's other phenomenal podcast series. While you're at it, be sure to follow us on Twitter or X at RATL Security, and be sure to leave a rating or review wherever you might be listening. Also, sign up to become a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon for an ad-free version of this podcast and other special benefits. Visit lawfaremedia.org slash support for more details. Our audio engineer and producer this week was Noam Osband of Goat Rodeo, and our music, as always, was performed by Sophia Yan, and we are once again edited by the wonderful Jen Pacha. On behalf of my co-host Alan and our special guests Natalie Orpet, Kevin Frazier, and Eugenia Lostry, I am Scott R. Anderson, and we will talk to you next week. Till then, goodbye. <laughs>